Chapter 8. The Awakening to the Over-Self Whoever has patiently practiced the exercises in meditation prescribed in this book and has thereby won through to the inner contact with his Divine Self will no longer need to repeat these exercises in the identical manner which he has he heard for followed. The minute analysis of self which has been the burden of his oft-repeated efforts becomes unnecessary and is eventually replaced by a more or less swift indrawing of the mind, which occurs soon after the student has put himself in silence and composed his thoughts. That is to say, once having arrived at the strong inner conviction that body, emotion and intellect are not himself, he need no longer repeat the technique of self-analysis in his meditations. He need only practice the breathing exercise, which has been given, and then place his mind in the half-question, half-prayer condition, which is described in the preceding chapter. After the necessary pause, the waiting period of humble expectancy, the response of the over-self will usually be forthcoming and he will temporarily enter the state of partial or complete inner illumination. For a brief while he will stand still in the center of his being, letting go completely of the frets and fictions of personal life, and returning to conscious integrality. The stream of mental quiet has at last carried him beyond the intellect. I shall not take the traveller on the secret path far across this threshold. Whatever happens to him henceforth will be an individual matter. And if he has had the courage and patience to come thus far, he will draw to himself the right guidance he may further need. Few ever cross far into this mystic realm, but most adventurers linger on the threshold, content with its seraphic brightness, its spiritual warmth, and its utterable, unutterable peace. But it is now necessary to utter a warning. If... In the foregoing outline of the secret path, I have given the impression that self-knowledge is a subject which one masters merely by practicing certain exercises, obeying certain rules, and studying certain ideas, precisely as one masters a mundane subject like physical culture, the student would not have formed a true concept of what he is required. So strangely subtle and peculiarly delicate are the moods which he has to invoke, that something more than conforming to a prescribed system is required, and that final but important ingredient he himself is powerless to, supp to supply. The awakening to spiritual consciousness is something which cannot be developed by a mechanical and measured system alone. Art happens, declared Ruskin, and so does spirituality. The aspirant carries on certain practice practices, whether meditation or relaxation, whether self-observation or self-remembering, carries on his effort of interrogative reflection, and one day the true consciousness seems to come to him, quietly, gently, but surely. That day cannot be predetermined. It may come early in his efforts, it may come only after long years of disappointing struggle, for it depends upon a manifestation of grace from the over self, of a force deeper than his personal will, which now begins to take a hand in this celestial game. Once the grace gets to work upon a man, there is no escape. Quietly, gradually, but perceptibly, it draws him inwards. The word grace is not one I am over keen to use. It has so many unpleasant and inaccurate theological connotations that, could I find a better, I would throw it aside. But I cannot, so I shall endeavor to assign it a meaning based on ascertainable spiritual experience and not on blind belief. Grace is the essential prerequisite for enlightenment. Yet you cannot supply it. Only your over-self or a true adept can do that. Grace may fall with astonishing and unexpected celerity on a man who has lived what the world would call a sinful life and change his heart, mind and consciousness very rapidly. Grace may withhold itself from a man who has spent 20 years studying tome after tome upon religion and philosophy. Its operation is often obscure, sometimes sudden and mysterious, and not infrequently a secret to other men. 
Yet for all this, it is not an arbitrary force. It possesses its own laws and ways of working, but only a true adept is in a position to ascertain them all. To obtain this grace, we must ask for it. This is not to say that the asking is done by verbal action alone. That may suffice for some, but others, the request may be uttered mentally only. But for most of us, we must ask with our whole life, our course of action, our sacrifices of the primrose path, our surrender of time even, should show and express this great desire, and we may even be forced down on our knees at unexpected hours of the night and day to pray that the light be granted us. If this happens, do not resist or resent it. Yield, and if you feel an urge to weep when praying for the overself's grace, then let the tears flow as copiously as they come forth. Do not hold them back. There is great spiritual merit in weeping for the visitation of a higher power. Each tear will dissolve something that stands between you and the divine union. Never be ashamed of tears, for they fall in a good cause. I have heard of a few who win grace without toil and sacrifice. Those few who receive it seemingly as a sudden gift dropped from the skies provide no exception to the rule of asking. Only their aspiration was uttered and heard in former existences, in earlier body births. Destiny has something to do with the matter and provides her detailed explanations of apparently erratic behavior only to those keen souls who have won her secret. When grace arises from our own overself, the latter sets up a certain urge in the heart and begins to lead our thoughts into certain channels. We become dissatisfied with our life as it is. We begin to aspire to something better. We commence a quest for a higher truth than the belief which has hitherto held us. We imagine, and naturally, that the change is due to a developing mind or sometimes to changing circumstance. But not so. Veiled behind the mystery that is life moves the unseen over self. The august being who has thus strangely interrupted our mortal sleep. The very quest for truth was simply a quest for the overself. Mayhap we find a worthier philosophy of life and thus come a little closer to self-realization. But the uplifting thoughts and moods of that changing period, whether a week or years, are merely a manifestation of grace, or if I may put it paradoxically, the results of an inner movement made by the motionless. Hard to grasp this truth that the aspirational call must come to us, we do not stir it into sound of our own accord. We must cast ourselves prostrate at the feet of the real self and pray for its grace. When the fire of divine aspiration awakens in our hearts, we know that some modicum of grace has been granted us. We who are servitors of the higher king must wait upon his mood. Grace is a gift, a favor to be received at the hands of the God within. It cannot descend at any arbitrary moment, however. It usually comes when the necessary bodily, environmental, and very experiential conditions are ripe. The spirit takes its own time, not ours. For we cannot kindle when we will the fire which in the heart resides. The spirit bloweth and is still. In mystery the soul abides. Matthew Arnold The ripening of the soul for this profound experience of union with the over-self takes place gradually as does the ripening of fruit. But once the growth is complete, then union overwhelms the soul with sudden downpouring and man is really born anew. There are certain root experiences which a man never forgets. The first day he loves a woman is one of them. The first day he lands on a foreign shore is another. And the first time he breaks the chrysalis of being to emerge as a conscious spiritual unit is a third, and is the greatest of all. The over-self makes no demand of man other than he open his inner eyes and perceive its existence. Yet the day of that vision is the most star day of his whole life, for on that day he stands on the edge of eternity. For this he was really born, and not merely to mend shoes or traffic in figures. If he misses this divine experience, even then nature will not let him escape. She is in no hurry, however. Somewhere in her spacious realm, she will yet catch him and compel him to fulfill her secret purpose. Who 
Whoever engages in such inward exploration is no dreamer. He merely antedates today what the multitude of men will have perforce to do tomorrow. Memorable is the grandeur of that august moment when he first beholds the divinity which environs him, but which, paradoxically, is also at the kernel of his being. In the ecstasy or quietude, as Robert Brooke called it, he learns to know what he truly is. As James Rhodes expressed it in beautiful verse, I am thy dawn from darkness to release. I am the deep wherein thy sorrows cease. Be still, be still, and know that I am God. Acquaint thyself with me and be at peace. Erase that record of the pali palimpsest within thee by the scribe of time impressed. And on the smooth surface write anew, I am all wisdom, righteousness, and rest. I am alone, thou only art in me. I am the stream of life that flows through thee. I comprehend all substances, fill all space. I am pure being, by whom all things be. Yes, I am spirit, in thy depths I dwell. Art, conscious of my presence, all is well. Cleave, but to that... Thyself art thine own heaven. Out of silence. Once we push the gate of the mind slightly ajar and let the light stream in, the meaning of life becomes silently revealed to us. The gate may be open for one minute or for one hour, and in that period we discover the secret that neither weary time nor bitter woe can tear that priceless knowledge away from us. Words fall dead when I try to express that meaning. But whoever has felt his whole inner being melt away and dissolve in the mysterious infinite during such meditation, as a result of constant aspiration or by the grace of some adept, will understand this thought I am feebly trying to convey. In the still presence of that mighty power, the soul walks on tiptoe. It is the most wonderful moment in a man's or woman's life, this illumination of the heart and mind. Find yourself, your overself and you will begin to find the meaning of life and begin to unveil the mystery of the universe. Back of each one of us there is this over-self, calm and as an unruffled sky, wise with the gathered experience of nature's many millions of years of existence, strong with a power to bring you the best which life has to offer. Let me recall the words of one who is perfectly aware of it, a humble carpenter turned teacher and who wandered along the shores of Galilee with a few disciples over 1900 years ago. He told them, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. These words are as true today as they were then. The man-god who spoke them is seemingly gone from our midst, but the divine truths to which he gave voice will always remain with mankind. Those who have those of us who have taken this peep through the door of our own being are dumbfounded. We draw back, surprised, at the inscrutable possibilities of the over-self. Man, as a spiritual being, possesses a capacity for wisdom which is infinite, a resource of happiness which is startling. He contains a divine infinitude within himself, yet he is content to go on and potter about a petty, stretch of life as though he were a mere human insect. When a man reaches the apex of truth, he is able to enjoy his own being, to gain from what that happiness which he has hitherto sought amid external things. Truth, beauty, peace, power, and wisdom are all attributes of the over-self, that self which awaits our finding. The divine self imparts whatever of idealism, insight, and nobility is present in us. We have yet to learn the true meaning of the verb to be. In the deeps of our miraculous being, we may discover that we are parts of a great life whose condition is peace eternal, whose purpose is utterly benevolent, and whose existence can never perish. Yet this is the true home state of every man. This timeless condition in which we discover ourselves has been beautifully described by the Hindu sages as the eternal now. 
Who knows his own nature knows heaven, declared Mencius, the Chinese disciple of Confucius. The spirit self of man remains unaltered and undisturbed in all its grandeur, while his personal self passes through the greatest vicissitudes of fortune. It is the indestructible element in him, the silent and the eternal witness to whom he must one day come and render homage. It is a light which no power can extinguish. It is man's immortal spirit, benign and tolerant, beautiful and unchanging. We are as close to the God within as we ever shall be. All we need to do is know this experiment and experience. The soul broods in secret over its great treasure. Let us come to rest in the center of our being and discover where diamonds and rubies that are hid. The over-self is the true being, the divine inhabitant of this body, the silent witness within the breast of man. Man lives every moment in the presence of this divine self, but the membrane of ignorance hangs over him and covers his sight and sense. This doctrine is one of the most difficult to justify. How explain to mortal, troubled man that this spiritual self can exist serenely apart, self-sufficing, untouched and untrammeled by any external condition? I fear this statement must look foolish to one who quakes at sight of misfortune or brightens at tidings of external good. How dare I tell him that he is self-hypnotized into despair or elation, and yet that he remains paradoxically free of both? The man of the world will ridicule this assertion, while the theologian may reject it. There is but one final answer to this puzzling riddle, one supreme authority to whom it can be referred for a solution, and that is the authority of one's personal experience. One's own first-hand realization that these things are true. Knowledge of the self is the absolute and all essential basis for knowledge of the truth. Our first and foremost thought is of self in a sense of I. Trace this thought down to its source and you will have found that in which it arises. And you will have found the over-self, truth, wisdom, God. Some will object to the inner shrine is shrouded in darkness and that the way there too is impossible. No, we must not be intimidated by such fears. The sanctuary is not impenetrable and if few appear to have found it in these days, it is because few have begun to search for it. Truth is written into the organism of man no less surely than into the inspired books. In the spacious society of the universe, man possesses a better status than he is yet aware of. Mostly in moments of secret mental quiet are hints brought to him concerning the grandeur which is native to the soul. This wisdom is the oldest wisdom in the world, far back as our foremost minds can peer, before the first pen was ever put to paper, ages beyond Buddha and Zoroaster. This single and simple truth that man can consciously unite with the divine while in the body was taught to those who aspired. The universality of experience which I have described is authentic testimony to its reality. The literatures of all lands, the philosophies and religions of all times bear witness to its truth. It appears in the pages of Grecian Plato and American Emerson. It can be found in the philosophies of Roman Porphyrus and German Fichte, in hallows and sayings of Syrian Jesus, and lights the words of Indian Buddha. To the real seer all creeds come alike. Those who profess the faith of Buddha are not less welcome than those who profess the faith of Christ. The entertaining of a single thought of a certain elevation makes all men of one religion. It is always some base alloy that creates the distinction of sects. Thought meets thought over in the widest gulf of time with unerring Freemasonry. I know, for instance, that Sadi entertained once identically the same thought that I do, and hereafter I can find no essential difference between Sadi and myself. He is not Persian, he is not ancient, he is not strange to me, but the identity of his thoughts with mine, he still survives said Henry David Thoreau, with truth. Different people in different lands have given this secret experience different names. Some Christians have called it union with God, while Hindu saints name it union with the spirit self. 
Some philosophers describe it as merging into the infinite, and others as finding truth. The label is not important. The wise will never quarrel over it, for words hint at but what cannot describe the fullness of this experience. Hindu and Hebrew mystic, Platonic and Pythagorean philosopher, Chinese and Christian moralist, all speak the same language and talk in the same tones if we but hear them aright. No matter how different are the creeds or how numerous the theologies may be, God was, is and can be but one primal one. Truth is the spiritual white light which falls upon the prism of mankind. It breaks into many colors whereby individuals interpret it. Thus the experience of discovering it is the same the world over. What differs is the interpretation thereof. Some will object that the world has received a bewildering array of reports from its mystics, from those who claim to have gone inwards, yet return with varying accounts of what they have experienced, witnessed, felt and understood. The admixture of religious dogmas and the misinterpretation of personal experiences have produced the bewildering mass of doc doctrines which, in the lump, is called mystical. The inability to adopt a strictly scientific attitude to the whole matter is responsible for the obfuscation of meditation's first object. Various paths have been devised to secure this object, but a multitude of narrow minds have mistaken the path for the goal. Meditation, yoga, mysticism, etc. have only one fundamental purpose, whatever prejudiced exponents or mistaken adherents may say. That purpose is to short-circuit the currents of thinking so that one may perceive the reality which thought obscures. In other words, advanced religious practices, methods of meditation, ecstatic saint worship, etc. are all means to help man slow down the stream of thoughts until he eventually stops its flow completely. Sectarian mentalities will, of course, vehemently object to this, but their denial is simply a denial of the true facts. Mature and penetrating souls alone can perceive this truth. They alone, by clarifying their understanding of this subject, can escape from the spiritual fog wherein most students and devotees habitually move. They alone know that the particular religious path anyone follows has less to do with his attainment than the mechanical method of mind control the unconsciously practices. They alone know that the absence of any creed whatsoever from his beliefs make a man no less successful than his more pious brother. What the advanced Indian yogi experiences as nirvana is substantially the same condition as what the advanced Christian mystic experiences as God. If either, in recording or describing this sublime state, tax onto it the theological or local doctrines peculiar to his race or land, we must describe these accretations to be their true source. The, true, the personal prejudices or mental bias of the seer and not the illumination itself. Illumination in its varying degrees is the same for all men alike. Every mystic rediscovers the same hidden treasure, but his description of it may be lamentably different, because his intellectual and emotional interpretation of it is different. There are degrees of illumination itself, and the most advanced degree of all seers obtain the same experience and agree perfectly in its understanding, but such are the rare few the gifted immortals among men. Temporary glimpses and experiences of a mystical nature have occurred in every country and in every land, but intelligent interpretations of these experiences is not so plentiful. The kindergarten alphabet of every creed has been dragged in to explain them, and that which descends out of the universal and infinite is chained to some local symbol. Our time demands a sensible and spiritual explanation of these things, not an unscientific and relig religio-materialistic one. Visionaries have recorded perfectly genuine experiences, both psychic and spiritual, yet they differ widely in their results. Why? because the beliefs with which they started out, the past experiences which have influenced their personalities, all of these have influenced the interpretation of their results. The interpretation may be unsound, therefore, when the inner experience is quite valid. We make the mistake of attempting to erect a circumscribing fence around this divine discovery. Through all ages, genuine seekers, but with narrow minds or little experience, have tried to force this wide ocean of truth knowledge into a small compound of doctrine or creed. 
cannot be done. And when their experience deepens, they may themselves come to realize that this is so. But the frowns of orthodox churches or the difficulty of explaining such subtle truth to the multitude often compels their silence. Creeds come and go. Cults arise and slowly disappear. Sects take the world stage for a time, but must ultimately make their exit. Yet the ancient wisdom, stripped of all its trappings of external expression, remains forever identical and unchanged. It is independent of race, witness Thoreau among the Americans and Sankara among the Indians. It is apart from the centuries. Rabindranath Tagore today and Meister Eckhart over 600 years ago. It is unaffected by climate. The fur-wrapped Tibetan hermit, Milarepa, dwelling on an icy plateau, ultimately arrives at the same truth as Plotinus living in warmer climbed Egypt. The same inward experience reformed the beautiful Persian poems of Jeloden Rumi as inspired the hunting, the haunting Christian verses of Francis Thompson. The inspirations of early Rome parallel the inspirations of early China. Similarities in these are startling. Thoughts are identical, but the vestures of those thoughts are necessarily subject to personal tastes and racial customs. The simple and beautiful sayings of Jesus carry the burden of truth's essential message. Study them well, and you shall find they correspond completely with the sayings or writings of other men who at one who are at one with the over self. All the masters of deep spiritual realization speak alike. Only the stumbling followers and professional theologians disagree and differ. Do you imagine that God showed himself to men only in those far off days when Christ stirred up an obscure corner of the Roman Empire, or when Buddha walked with the begging bowl? If God cannot show himself again today, then his power has become strangely circumscribed and the absolute has suddenly shrunk back to the finite. Is it not better to believe that he is ready to reveal himself to all who care to fulfill the conditions precedent to revelation? The Eternal has spoken to man and the past, in the past and can speak to him again. Who can explain the spell which men like Christ and Buddha flung over their auditors by means of a few words? A rhetorical genius cannot explain it. Intellectual genius cannot explain it. Something more than these things is required to make plain why their silent glances moved stony hearts which no eloquent perotations were ever likely to move. Some mysterious possession of a power at once awe-inspiring and divine. For centuries, erudite scholars have trained their searchlights upon the story of Jesus. They have examined minutely every shred of information about him, every source and every document, that might make their vision of the mysterious Galilean a little clearer. And now, nearly 2,000 years after the death of the inspired Jew, he remains still an enigmatic and unfamiliar figure. His biography is still largely imaginative. His personality has been pictured in a thousand contradictory ways. His teachings have been used to buttress opposing institutions. Yes, though the world still writes the name of this wonderful man with a certain veneration, still holds his high above every other name in the West, he remains a mystery. The unaided intellect of man can never solve this mystery. Out of the divine infinite he came to the tribes of men, gave his sacred words, and was gone. Such was the outer picture. For Christ descended on earth from a superior planet, which was his real home, and which is far ahead of ours in spiritual consciousness, to bless and serve men by his presence. This descent was his real cross, his real crucifixion, and those who sincerely seek him may still find him in their hearts. But divinity was not buried in the tomb with Jesus. Have no holy voices spoken since then? Can we not search history for the past 2,000 years and find the names of a few men whose presence and look testified to lofty spiritual attainment? Is not the deeper life always extending into sublime invitation to us? Why should we hide these simple truths under a complicated jargon? Why should we dress this beautiful figure of truth in coarse sackcloth? Men like Buddha and Jesus 
did not disdain to expound their thoughts in clear-cut phrase and to explain their meaning in simple words. The profounder thoughts can be simply expressed. It is not at all necessary to put them into prose of Sumerian mystery. Yet there are those who delight in using vocabulary and phraseology which build barriers between truth and its mental understanding. The stake and the gallows and the cross once waited for the spiritual pioneers who dared to utter heterodox thoughts. Hence a jargon of obscure and guarded terminology grew up among some who walked this lone path. But there is no justification in the 20th century for the weird jargon of medieval days still current in certain circles. The highest truths can now be revealed without fear of the hanging rope or the torture rack. Why frighten simple truth seekers by piling up complicated mysteries? In former times, this interior path and its results were described in publishing books under poetical, symboli symbolical, and alleg allegorical phrases. Such a style was of use to the intuitional who were able to read therein something which the unenlightened man could never perceive. In the present era, the time has come to speak more openly and more plainly of these matters. We live in an intellectual and scientific age when a set of teachings must be presented in a manner which will appeal to the ordered intelligence of man. Any other kind of presentation will cause such teachings to be treated as poetry, as the decoration of spare moments. The prevalence of science and the popularization of knowledge has fostered man's intellect. Therefore, a modern expression of truth must at least make us as strong an appeal to his mind as, that, as to his heart. The needs of the brain cannot be despised by any spiritual message these days, though they should not be permitted to play the despot. We who have had first-hand experience of the amazing potenti potentialities of meditation must be ready to meet the doubter on his own ground, and to free him who is a prisoner of the primitive conceptions that man is nothing more than his material body, and that the world was formed from nothing more than the primeval mud. It is not enough to tell him that our stars burned a little brighter at our births. We must show him how to kindle a greater light for himself too. If still he insists on shutting his eyes to the possibilities of man's new life here and now, he will have no excuse for the spiritual darkness which environs him. Yet there is little that is radically new here. In the historical sense, only the synthesis and proper proportioning of these thoughts will appear fairly fresh with this book. But everything that has not been tried out is new, and these things have not been tried by the world at large. The trained modern intelligence demands and must receive a better presentation of truth than the mere aspirations of a religio-moral sentimentality. We must remember too that the teachers who came in the past came to peoples whose mentalities were unlike our own, and came at times when the economic problems of industrial civilization had not become so heavy as to press down upon all others. They came to Eastern peoples, who are naturally more sensitive than our own whose minds are less sceptical and less restless, and whose hearts are habitually turned towards religious devotion. It must therefore be clear that the sages of today, and the West especially, should forget the presentations of the past in order to remember the needs of the present. Hence, they will seek to give out expressions of truth suited to the times. Such expressions are already taking shape in various movements and cults, however partial they may be. So too, in this teaching of spiritual self-inquiry, it is needful to show what worth and value it possesses for those who are held captive by the perpetual agitation of modern life, and what practical application may be made of its fundamental principle that the real self of man is divine.